Thank you, uh, first of all, for inviting me uh, tonight uh, here in the British Embassy. It's actually my first time here, so um, I really enjoy it here. It's a beautiful building. Um, and I want to start by, of course, introducing myself. Um, I'm Isa Sonnfeld. I'm leading the news lab at Google um, for Germany, Switzerland, and Austria. Um, the past four years, and I joined, uh, as it was mentioned before, I joined a month ago. So it's a whole new world for me as well. Um, but for the past four years, uh, I was working at Twitter um, and uh, being responsible for uh, news and government relationships um, and the strategic um, relationship uh, building there. Um, and when I thought about the topic of tonight, uh, making sense of big data, um, I actually realized that even before joining Google and before joining Twitter, um, I was working or I was trying to make sense of big data myself. Um, that was 2009 and I was writing my, uh, my master's thesis uh, in political science and I was analyzing the social signals during the 2009 uh, chancellor's debate. And I was focused on, on tweets at that time um, because Twitter and politics played a big role. Um, and I think I analyzed around 40,000 tweets manually which took a long time. Um, and now I know that it takes maybe a few seconds. Um, so a lot has changed since 2009. Um, and I want to talk today about how to make sense of big data from a really journalistic point of view. So a lot of, a lot of things have changed um, in those years, um, but something that doesn't have changed is that the ticker doesn't work. No. <laughs> okay, so that hasn't changed. Um, it's Google's mission and it's to organize the world's information and make it un universally accessible and useful. And um, if we examine that mission um, in more detail, um, it's hard to think about a more important source than, or a more important source um, of information than quality news content. And so we at Google News Lab, and it's a really new team and new effort at Google, we at Google News Lab um, think about that in a way that we want to collaborate with journalists, academics, and entrepreneurs, media entrepreneurs, um, to drive innovation um, in media. And so, the ultimate goal of the News Lab is first, of course, to collaborate with those players, journalists, academics, media entrepreneurs, the new voices in, in media. And we do that by three, or in three different ways. The first one is tools. We want to make sure that journalists and academics have the best tools at hand in order to make sense of big data or to really work um, uh, or really um, uh, enhance their storytelling. Second is programs. Um, we want to collaborate with the new voices in media and um, we work for example with the European Journalism Center, um, Hacks and Hackers and many other international, not only international but also um, European partners um, to, to create this level of innovation and to hopefully um, create new products or new ideas around storytelling. And the third part is of course data. Um, our goal is to provide journalists and academics and the new voices in media with the best of Google data and to help them create immersive, really interesting, really innovative stories. Um, and tonight um, I'm going to focus, of course, on the data bit from a journalistic point of view. And I think the most successful, or not successful, but the most um, important data set that Google has is search. So just one number, three billion searches every day, over 100 billion searches every month. Um, and that can be a really interesting source uh, for journalists and academics. <laughs> Um, and because we have this new, really collaborative approach um, at News Lab, at the News Lab, um, we think that creating a more informed world, more informed society, journalists and technologists have to work together. 
Um, we came up with a really broad curriculum at the moment, um, but we listened to a lot of journalists. We uh, visited many, many newsrooms over the past year, and um, we figured out that not every journalist and not every academic has access to those tools and has access to Google Trends data, for example. And so that's our biggest effort that we now trying to, uh, to follow up on. Google Trends is the starting point for uh, journalists and academics. Um, and Google Trends, or the data behind Google Trends, has been in the past okay, I would say. So, and also, we, we talked to a lot of journalists. We, talked, we, we spent a lot of time in newsrooms. And journalists and editors told us every single time that the trends data is not real time. And I'm going to show you how it looked like. So that was trends before this summer. You looked for, for example, Zeb Blatter, and you got this graph. It's not really compelling, and you can't really tell the story behind it uh, or create a story behind it. Um, and so the team, the trends team at Google and within the Google News Lab, um, thought a lot about it. How can, how can we create or make Google Trends um, a better data source for journalists and academics? And this is what Google Trends looks today. It's, it's much more real time, um, and it shows you the peaks of interest, so the peaks of people searching in that example for Zeb Blatter. Um, and this is only a really basic search query that you do. And in the next couple of minutes, I'm going to show you a couple of um, examples uh, about how journalists, uh, in, in collaboration with us or without even our support, um, made sense of big data, made sense of um, Google data. And what, what we also incorporated in uh, the Google Trends setup um, was trending stories. So a trending stories feed that showed you, and which is based on um, not only Google search, but also on other um, Google products like YouTube um, or others. And trending stories shows you in real time what is trending on Google. So it's the longest, I would say, the longest feed of breaking news stories um, that can at least point you to a topic or to a story. Um, of course, the journalistic investigative work follows up on that. And it also shows um, during, for example, breaking news events or moments like the US election that is coming up uh, next year, um, it shows you different ways on how to use uh, and how to analyze Google data, on the, which you can see on this election 2016 Google searches site. So what Google data can really tell you um, are different things. It can show you what people really care about um, because they search for different topics in real time and they're pretty honest about it. So, um, and I'm going to start with a really simple data visualization based on Google Trends, even though I'm not sure how many Halloween enthusiasts are still in the room, but I'm still going to show it. Um, so, most of you know, last weekend it was Halloween. Set, which is a new online site um, launched by Site Online recently, looked at Google data uh, and wanted to ask, like, who's interested in Halloween in Germany? Um, and where should we look for party tips? Uh, and how uh, or who looked for party tips? So really a basic question that lies behind this data visualization, but beautifully visualized in that way. And I didn't show that because um, I think it doesn't really fit in the, in, into uh, my whole run up of the slides, but we also looked for costumes, dog costumes for Halloween. So even you can search for uh, a dog costume uh, at Halloween. Something simil, uh, simple and, and quite funny. But what you can also do with Google Trends data is looking at sentiment. 
And looking how people react to certain events, breaking news stories, um, that drive your market or drive another story that is following up. So BBC News in that example um, looked at uh, the most searched for leadership candidates um, of labor. And you can see on the map um, not only one instant and one snapshot of it, um, but you can actually look at this data from seven days or 24 days or a month or over a year. So you can see the changes in interest in um, political candidates, or in that case, uh, the Labour Party, uh, Labour leadership candidates. And whenever there is a global event happening, people either join the conversations on social media platforms like Twitter or any other platform, or they go to Google and search for more information. They want to know what is happening, um, who's involved, or um, what's the background story of that event that just happened. Um, and I want to show you one example of Mashable. Um, and that example shows you um, the search interest after the massive earthquake in Na Nepal uh, in April and how people search for the two words helping Nepal. And um, we help Mashable in that way to visualize that data, but Mashable on their side, of course, uh, gave the context and gave the analysis and gave the background information for readers um, where they can help victims of the Nepal earthquake and how they can do that. So the important thing here is that Google data is interesting from a point of view that you can visualize it very easily, but journalists, academics have to put it in context and analyze it and give a reader the perspective on what that beautiful um, animated visualization actually means. Um, so I think at that, at that stage where journalists and academics use Google data or data in general, um, the most important thing is to really put it in context. Another example I wanted to show, and it is a visualization and it is interactive or it was interactive, but we had some uh, technical hiccups here, so it's not moving at all, but you can definitely look it up afterwards. Um, but we, what we did there, um, we analyzed a year, a data set of over a year searches about climate change, so air pollution, um, global warming, and other issues, and um, ranked that um, based on three different approaches. So the first approach was we looked at the top questions being asked in the top 20 major cities. Second approach was we were looking at search interest in each city. So in Berlin, in Paris, in Rome, what were people looking for on Google um, if they would look for global warming, air pollution, etc. And then we were ranking city, then we were the, ranking the cities by interest. Um, and so we got a really immersive picture of what were people thinking and looking for on Google um, if they were related to, um, well, climate change issues. And I would love to show you the moving earth, but it doesn't work. So Google Trends data and data in general can t can, can't only tell you um, changes in behavior or changes in interest, um, but it also can tell you how, on which level curiosity is actually, um, is actually based. So this is again a very simple example, um, and it's been done by the Telegraph actually, um, looking at in which language do you actually Google. And they analyzed 135 languages in nine cities. Um, from 2004 to, two, uh, to 2015. And you can see um, per city the change of the languages, which language was mostly used when people were searching on Google. Um, and a really simple idea behind that. Um, and so 
Google Trends can show you how the world's most used languages actually change over time. Another example which I found interesting, looking at Japanese uh, as a language, um, and you can see how the visualiz visualization is moving, and New York still being on rank two in that case, but it's changing over time. So that's the interesting part there, that Google data can show you a wide range of data pieces and data sets, but if you put it in context, you actually see the changes of behavior or interest. And of course, elections all around the world um, are from a data editor point of view or data journalist or academic point of view really interesting because uh, you can analyze what people look for and search for. They search for candidates, they search for topics, uh, they search for parties, um, and they sometimes, or this data set sometimes even gives you a trend line on what they will vote in the end. And I hope this visualization works, um, but yes, okay, it works. Uh, so we looked at the Republican candidates um, and looked at the, the, way the, the, the way it changes the, or the perception of the candidates changes. Um, and I don't know if you see it, so red is Donald Trump, and if you look now at another, at the second visualization, you will see that it's all red. Um, so you see that there's much more interest uh, in Donald Trump than there was before. Another really beautiful visualization, uh, it's like a horse race, uh, but it's actually the GOP debate, um, right after, well, during the GOD, uh, GOP debate. Um, and this is also what Google data can provide. Um, it's this real-time data and the interest or in the cha and shows the interest in change, uh, shows the change in interest in those candidates. Um, and I think the way it is visualized is actually quite compelling and easy to understand even for a non-data expert or academic. So the question is always, how do you get these data sets? One way, and that's also the work um, of the Google Trends team, one way is to go to our open GitHub page. Um, and we provide journalists, academics, and users um, with specific data sets that we um, give them access to. Another way is, for example, Google, Google Public Data Explorer where you can search for specific data sets, download them, and maybe combine them then with maps and create really beautiful visualizations. So in order to finish here, um, our goal and our mission is uh, to get collaborate with journalists, to collaborate with academics, and to make sure that the data that Google provides um, from a journalistic point of view is being put in context, is being analyzed, not by us, but by journalists and academics. Um, and I want to thank you for listening. And if you want to learn more about the News Lab, of course, go to g.co slash News Lab or follow me on Twitter and approach me later. Thank you.